I uh, sure hope you're doing well. Uh, just pause on a personal note and thank uh, so many messages and Facebook messages and texts and stuff, uh, prayers for our family. Uh, my mom passed away about a week ago now. Uh, she was uh, just had a doctor's appointment with a clean bill of health, <laughs> sits down and watches Perry Mason and goes to be with the Lord. So whatever episode that was of Perry Mason, I think they should take it off the air. But uh, I'll, I'll write somebody a note about that. But I thank you for all the love that we have felt as a family from you and appreciate that so much. So the only kind of uh, anxiety I have, if you will, about speaking after uh, such a fresh loss is I, I, I don't know when I'm going to lose it anymore. And so like, I mean, I, yesterday I was just mowing the grass and all of a sudden for no reason just started crying uh, because I missed her. And so that may happen. If it does, it'll be okay. Just relax, okay? We're just going to get through and, uh, and, and, and I'll be fine. So I appreciate your prayers, but especially the love that you've expressed. Um, heard from the team from Mozambique. Uh, this is kind of ties into it. So my dad is actually on that team uh, that we sent to Mozambique. Uh, they're in Qatar right now, touring the capital city this morning, and uh, then we'll continue the trek over to Mozambique. Um, dad had planned to go on that trip, kind of to help our guys get used to uh, foreign travel, and particularly in Africa. Dad has done that several times. And so uh, he found felt he should still go, and so they're helping to hold him together this morning. It's kind of a neat family, uh, church family thing, and, uh, and we're excited about that as well. So uh, let's have a word of prayer. I'll get, get started. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for the love of these people that uh, our family's been able to receive over the last uh, week or so, and uh, I pray, Father, for the next few moments that um, you would hide me in your cross. Lord, uh, this is like a big buffet table that we have. And all of us are pulled up a chair and got a fork, and we're sitting around this big table. And now we get to choose. We need to select something that will nourish us. And so I pray over the next few moments you would provide what we need to nourish us, to nurture our souls, each and every one of us. And uh, meet us where we are and take us to where you desire for us to be in your name. Amen. Uh, what I think about Bible people is that we tend to put them in this different category than normal people. So when I read stories about what happens for people in the Bible, I kind of think, wow, that's really weird. That would actually never happen in my life, or that's not something that has been my experience with God. And so I form some conclusions like, good for them, but that could never happen for me. God doesn't talk to me like that or direct me like that and, or deliver me from things like, like he does in the Bible. However, so this series... We're not so much focusing on Jonah or Daniel or Samson or, or Joseph, but the main character we're looking at that is sort of tying all of these stories together is actually the main character is God. He's the one we're looking at, and so uh, we're, we're kind of seeing what his role in all of it is, and, and, and the reason this has caused us to sort of sit up and take notice is this, as we hear all these strange, you got to be kidding me kind of stories, and looking at God as the main character the thing that, that's caused us to pause and take notice is this. God doesn't change. So the same God in all of these stories that we're dealing with is the God that we've come to worship today. So Malachi says this. I don't know how we make it any clearer. I, the Lord, do not change. And in Hebrew, it says, I, the Lord, do not change. You know, it's the exact, that's what it means. And then you go into the New Testament and look at Hebrews. and It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what that means, just so we're all on the same page, is, the, is the, what we're reading about the God in these stories, that's the same God we pray to. It's the same God we're raising our children with or that we just worshiped. That's the same God. So if we believe the Bible, and this church goes on record as saying the Bible has authority here because we believe it, then if it's true for people in the Bible, it has to be a possibility for us. Now, you're a wise thinking people for the most part, and so, you know, you all have some questions and maybe even some pushback related to this. You know, these are impossible stories, living for three days in the belly of a whale or the belly of a fish or tying strength to long hair or a boy that takes a giant down with a slingshot. Those things are impossible. And you know what? Jesus would agree with us. Jesus reads those stories and thinks, those things are impossible, in fact, he said it. Jesus said the exact same thing. What he said was this, what is impossible with men or impossible with people is now actually possible with God. So the miraculous, the things that we can't explain, those things are possible. So here's the reality that, about God that these you got to be kidding me stories to sort of bring into the forefront of our minds. Whether we actually own them or not, we at least have to acknowledge there's a possibility of them. The cumulative message that's changing our outlook and hope is this. 
God does have the ability to intervene in his creation and do the impossible. God does have the ability to intervene in your life and my life and do the impossible. How do you know it? Well, it's what he did. It's in, it's in the pages of Scripture. And that's kind of what I want to go after today. Today we're going to look at four guys, and they're put into a, into a situation that none of them would choose. The situation they're put into is something called slavery. And they're all put into this thing of slavery. They don't want anything to be a part of it. or don't want to be part of it at all. They feel helpless, afraid. Maybe even some of them feel sort of angry. And we need to pause long enough before we get fully into the story to say, everybody in the room gets this. If we're all going to worship the same God, and we're talking about the same God as these four guys, see, we all come to the point in an area or two where we feel totally helpless or out of control or an uninvited guest came into your life and, and, and kind of tore things up. Or maybe we're all faced with this difficult decision or a decision that we all know because we've come to this same point several times in our lives that these four guys are going to come to. And here's the point. Do I hold on to my faith or do I let go of my faith and pursue something else? And you've been there. I've been there. Do I stay after this faith thing or do I turn my back on it and I pursue something else? Because either way that these four guys choose is going to have some consequences for them. Their stories are told in the book of Daniel. Jerusalem is uh, invaded by Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon, modern-day Iraq, if you look at it on a map. And Nebuchadnezzar is the most powerful dude on the planet at this point in time. Once he conquered Israel, he didn't want all the Hebrew people to come and be his slaves. He just wanted the best and the brightest. So he chose the best and the brightest of the Hebrew people to be his slaves, and they would serve in his palace. And so he takes these four guys to the place. The four of the slaves, we know them as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. That's kind of how those four guys are. And all of these four guys were deeply devoted to their faith and were introduced to them in the first chapter of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. Once they get to Babylon as slaves, Nebuchadnezzar says, all the people that are going to be in my house have to eat my diet. And so part of the problem was, the diet Nebuchadnezzar ate was, was meat that had been offered to idols. Well, for these four guys who are God followers, that would have been a violation of their personal beliefs of what they think God would want them to do. And so they say to Nebuchadnezzar, I'll tell you what, you eat your diet and all these other slaves, we're going to eat something else. And after 10 days, if we look bad, then you, we'll eat your stuff. And so the Nebuchadnezzar agreed to that. So everyone else, you know, they had all this meat offered to idols, and Daniel and them, they, they eat, ate salads and stuff, I guess. I don't know. They weren't happy, but they really looked good. They looked really good. And so they had all these salads and stuff, and these had, in 10 days, they looked great. And so Daniel is allowed to actually begin to not have to eat meat offered to idols. One other thing happens in Daniel chapter 1 you should be aware of. These four young men, Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding for all kinds of literature and learning. And check this out. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. You've got to get this before we move further in the book. Because if you don't understand that God has given this power, the rest of the book isn't really going to make sense at all. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2 opens up with Nebuchadnezzar having this dream. And it's a weird dream. And when he wakes up from his dream, he calls his advisors and all the special people around him and says, hey, I want you all to tell me the meaning of the dream. Not just that, I want you to tell me what the dream was. Well, all the advisors are kind of lost and they're like, I have no idea what we're going to do. And then they remembered Daniel. Didn't that, didn't that guy we just brought over here from Jerusalem, can't he interpret visions and dreams? So they go and get Daniel. Because the, the punishment, if they couldn't do it, Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm going to kill you because he had like personality issues and stuff. But Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to kill you if you can't interpret these dreams. So they bring Daniel and put him in front, because they think, well, if Daniel can't interpret, what's that loss? Daniel gets in front of Nebuchadnezzar, and he can actually do it. He not only tells the king what he dreamed, but then he interprets it. Nebuchadnezzar's dream was something like this. There was this big statue of himself, and uh, basically the statue had this head that was made of gold, and the arms and chest were made of silver, and the legs and stomach were bronze. And, and Daniel said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the golden head. And that's when Nebuchadnezzar stopped listening. 
All he heard was he was the golden head. But the rest of his dream was this huge rock came and destroyed the statue. Nebuchadnezzar never heard that. All he heard was he was the golden head. That's chapter 2. In chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar decides he's going to build that golden statue. So he makes this statue 75 feet tall, and he makes it out of gold. And here's what was going on. When music plays, everybody's supposed to stop and worship that statue. That was the plan. And so they did. They built this huge statue, looks like Nebuchadnezzar, made out of gold, and the music would play, and everybody in the country was supposed to stop, bend, and worship the statue. Everybody did it except for three guys. And when the whole country is bowing and you're not, it's hard to blend in. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego decided they weren't going to bend the knee to this statue. And so they're called before the king, and the king threatens them in Daniel chapter 3, verse 15. But if you do not worship it, which I think is funny that they call the statue it. If you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then, Nebuchadnezzar asks, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And so they do it again. They play the music, the whole country bows down, and everybody watches Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they don't bend the knee. They don't bow down. So even in the midst of the threat of the most powerful person on the planet, these guys stand strong. And then they spoke these words to Nebuchadnezzar. And I think these are some of the, one of the greatest treasures in all of Scripture. It says this. The guys are speaking now to Nebuchadnezzar in verse 17. says this. Nebuchadnezzar, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, check this out. The God we serve is able to save us from it. He can do that. And so far, everybody's excited. Oh, this is a great God we serve. I'm glad we're here, all that kind of stuff. The next verse could change, should, could change the American church if we actually bought it. God is actually able to do this, and the next verse says, says this, but even if he doesn't, check that out. Even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O king, we're not bending the knee. We're not going to serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. Isn't that amazing? So, yes, God could deliver us from you, but even if he doesn't, we're not bending the knee. Now, this I marvel at, and to be honest with you, I'm quite challenged by it because it's not based on this comfortable life or good conditions in their life. These guys have tapped into something deeper, a deep belief that all things were to be understood through the main character, and the main character of this life, ready, isn't you, and it's not me. The main character of this life is God. So the king follows through with his promise and he throws these three guys into a furnace and this is where the weird entered the building. Because even though they had thrown these three guys into the furnace to face a certain death, the king and his advisors see something weird. And this is actually comical. If you think of like a Three Stooges routine or something, I don't know, but it's going to get comical, trust me. In a minute, it's going to get funny. But here's how, here's how this literally plays out in Scripture. They throw the three guys in. When they look in, they don't see three guys. They see four guys. And Nebuchadnezzar says, approach the, he says, to them, one of those dudes looks like actually the son of God. So whatever's going on inside the furnace, these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then there's some dude who's in there looks like looks like a god, whatever that would be in your mind. And so Nebuchadnezzar and his advisors have to consult with each other to see how many people they threw in the furnace because they can't remember. They say, hey, something funny going on right here. Didn't we throw in three people? Because now I see four, one, two, three, four people, and we only threw in three. That's not right. And they're like, yes, king, that's exactly what we did. So Nebuchadnezzar then goes to the opening of the furnace, chapter 3, verse 26, and he shouts, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High, y'all come out of there. Now, this is funny. Notice he didn't ask the fourth guy to come out. So what he said was, you three come out. Whoever you are, you just stay on in there. I don't, I don't want anything to do with you, whatever you are. And so they come out, and they're not singed or burned and didn't even smell like fire. Watch this. The pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon said, praise be to the God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angels and rescued his servants. They trusted in him, watch this, and defied the king's command 
and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own. If the modern church would get a hold of that last part, it would change our churches and our communities. If we would actually buy into the belief that we're following a God that we will not compromise for. I would rather serve or worship any God they'd rather serve or worship that God than serve or worship any other God. King Nebuchadnezzar dies. His son takes over. There's a great story. There's actually another dream King Nebuchadnezzar has, but I'm not going to tell you. You can read it for yourself because it's really weird. But then his son takes over, and I'm not going to tell you that story either, but I'll tell you this. Have you ever heard this, the phrase, the handwriting's on the wall? It comes from the story in Daniel chapter 5. That's where it comes from. You can read it for yourself this afternoon. Chapter 6, King Darius shows up. King Darius and Daniel are good friends. They golf together, loosely interpreted. And so they're good friends. And, and now King Darius is on the throne and Daniel and friends. Well, the other advisor of the king, they're sort of jealous of Daniel being good friends with Darius. So they trick the king. And they say, hey, Darius, wouldn't it be cool if everybody just worshipped you for 30 days and nobody else? And Darius is like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And so he passes this decree. You can only worship Darius for 30 days, King Darius. And then Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. When Daniel learned about the decree that had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God, not Darius, just as he had done before. Nothing hidden. You see, the circumstances had changed. And we get this. Uh, this hurt, this disease, this loss, this relationship changed. And then this changes so often. Oh God, this changed, therefore I'm turning my back on you, but not Daniel. Daniel says, this has changed, but I'm going to keep doing what I've always done. Well, Daniel's arrested, and Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. I don't know how they had that. They just have it laying around or what you had to do to get one of those. But they had a lion's den, and they just threw him into the lion's den. And the king sees his own folly, sees his own arrogance, and he says to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. Isn't that a cool thing to say about someone? The God that I see you step with all the time. I've never seen you waver. May that, may that God rescue you. You ever had a sleepless night because of a poor decision you made? You know, you toss and turn, flip the pillow over, kick the blankets off, put the blankets back on, count the ceiling tiles, get up and watch TV, eat a bag of chips, a thing of ice cream, and you, you just can't sleep? If you've ever had one of those nights, you're just like King Darius that night. He couldn't sleep either. He tried everything. And so the first light, he goes running out to the lion's den. And he sticks his head into the lion's den and he calls out to Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually, he said it twice, been able to rescue you from the lions. Now, if I were Daniel, I wouldn't have answered. <laughs> Just kind of you know, kind of have this moment. He's up there. Oh, Daniel. Oh, Daniel. I was like, has, he, has he rescued you? And I'm, or maybe just like, Bruh. you know, I don't know, whatever you do, just kind of roar. But, but Daniel's in the Bible, so he didn't do that. And so what Daniel said, he said, oh, king, live forever. That's also something I probably wouldn't have said. And then he says, my God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions, and they haven't hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Those are two weird stories, aren't they? Fiery furnace and a lion's den. <laughs> Probably haven't run into that this week, have you? And yet, at this point in the message prep, I was thinking, but I can relate to these guys a lot. See, see if you can. They have faith in God. And you know what? I have faith in God. Most of you probably have some kind of faith in God. So we're alike there. They had difficulty in their lives. You know what? I've had difficulty in my life, and you probably have too. Third, 
They had to make a choice between compromising and staying consistent. I've had to make that choice. And sometimes I chose to compromise, right? And sometimes I chose to remain consistent. They had to choose to hold on to a faith position even though there would be consequences. I've had to do that, haven't you? Had to choose to do the right thing even though it would be easier to not do the right thing. And lastly, God took care of the hard thing of that day. The day they got thrown into the furnace and the day they got thrown into the lion's den. But guess what? The next day, they were still slaves. And all four of them died in slavery. And I get that too. God has taken care of this thing in the moment, but there's still this big thing going on. And you get that. I don't think any of these guys were fearless in the face of the consequences of believing God would do something miraculous. I don't think any of them felt that. I don't think they walked to the lion's den and said, bring it on, they're not going to touch me. I think Daniel went into the lion's den bracing for impact, wondering which one was going to gnaw on him first. I don't think the three guys facing a fiery furnace, whatever's involved in that, I don't think they walked into the fiery furnace thinking, this isn't going to touch me. Do, 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 do. I don't think that's at all what they thought. I think they thought, this is it. It's over. But you know what they did have that's ministering to me so greatly these days? You, you know what they faced, you know, in the face of consequences? Because I don't walk into my consequences or in, into my struggles in life thinking, God's going to do something miraculous here. But what they did walk into that I see in these stories, and maybe you can do, is actually described in Daniel chapter 12, verse 13. At the end of the book, Daniel says this, As for you, go your way until the end, whenever that is. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you're going to rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Here's what all that means to me. You see, this kingdom of God that we're a part of as believers is both a now and a not yet. You have it in your life and I have it in my life. The kingdom of God is actually what's taking place here in our lives that allows us to worship and be strengthened and encouraged by being together, but it's also a not yet. There's an allotted inheritance that is the not yet, a time when we'll see God face to face and we'll be free from sin and illness and loss and pain and hurt and grief. That's a not yet. That's an amazing thing. I don't know what all it looks like, but apparently that's what the Scripture teaches. It's what's promised. But the kingdom of God is also a here and now. For whatever it is you're facing, whatever lion's den or furnace or struggle or trial, we all have the promise that's available to us right now through Jesus. And it's that we get to do life with God through the gift of His Holy Spirit. And He resides in each and every one of us who call Him our Father. And He directs and He comforts and He brings joy and He brings strength. And God does that for us in this life. Frederick Bigner describes it this way. The kingdom of God is where our best dreams come from and our truest prayers. We glimpse it at those moments when we find ourselves being better than we are and wiser than we know. And we catch sight of it when at some moment of crisis, a strength comes to us that is greater than our own strength. The kingdom of God is where we belong. It is home. And whether we realize it or not, I think we are all of us homesick for it. That's the kingdom of God. It's not yet in a here and now. See, see, people believe that Jesus will keep the boogeyman away. But he doesn't. He doesn't. If you've bought that bill of goods, you should return it to the store. We think that if we'll do the right things, God notices and nothing bad will ever happen. But then something bad does happen, and it results for this crisis of faith for people. And people walk away because they followed a promise that God never made to them. 
If we learn anything from the fiery furnace in the lion's den today, it's this. There is no promise in Scripture that links our level of faith with the absence of hard times in our life. Did you follow what I just said? There is no promise in Scripture that if you'll come to church every week and serve in the nursery and put a fish on your car, nothing bad will ever happen to you. That's not in the Bible. (laughs) Just because life is hard right now, it doesn't mean God has lost track of you or God doesn't care about you. It certainly doesn't mean God doesn't love you. That's not what's on the table. And while there is no promise in Scripture that Christians never have a bad day, there is one that I have found tremendously encouraging over the last week. There's a promise in Scripture several times that does link our level of faith with the presence of God's grace and strength at the hard times of our lives. Two of the scriptures that were sent to me kind of pointed this out. And this is plastered throughout the pages of scripture. But one of the scriptures that Lisa and I received this week was this from Psalm. Uh, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Isn't that cool? Don't you wish it said the Lord prevents broken hearts? (laughs) But it doesn't happen. Don't think it does. Don't ask God to do it. it. That's not what he does. But what it does do is says this but you aren't going through this alone. There's another one that was sent me. This one came from Isaiah. It says this, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. What does that mean? Well, you remember, you remember when you had little kids, like back when they were cute, And you remember that kid would get afraid about something? Like they go to the zoo and see a monkey or a tiger or something and they get freaked out. Or maybe you're in like the Walmart parking lot and <laughs> that freaked you out, but it, you freaked them out. Or maybe you're like going across the stream. Do you remember? And you remember what the kid does instinctively? Right? He grab a hold. Because the kid knows as long as dad's here, I'm good. And I know as long as Lisa's here, I'm good, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know where that came from? You know where that comes from in us? It comes from the promise of God's presence at our side. No matter what. That's where it's coming from. You are actually tapping into the image of God in you. God says, I will be here. See, here's the reality that I think we can learn from Daniel in the lion's den. Sometimes... You go looking for the lion, and the lion bites you. (laughs) We've all made a poor decision. Maybe somebody dates the wrong person, marries the wrong person, breaks a vow, drink too much, carry too much hate. You decide to stay mad. You decide not to forgive. Whatever. You make poor financial choices. You're chasing the lion, and you ignore the warnings, and as a result, the lion has bit you today, and you know it and you feel it. That's some of us in the room. But sometimes the lions come looking for you and bite you. (laughs) Sometimes you didn't choose the diagnosis or the loss or the change or the ending of a relationship or the emotional battle, but you have it and you've been bitten. You didn't choose your parents to act a fool or your kids to act a fool or whatever, but you have it and you got bit. You're the victim or maybe just the one that's suffering and you've been bitten because you're part of this fallen world. But here's where I'm at. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter whether I chased the lion or the lion chased me. The big thing is God's still present. God's still alongside, no matter how you got bit, no matter how I got bit. God is still walking around the furnace and hanging out in the lion's den because this is what God does. He's close to the brokenhearted, he said. When you pass through the waters, he says, I am with you. I've done this weird thing with you before, but I found some comfort in it this week, so I thought maybe I could talk you into doing it with me again. If you want to take, if you would, take your hand and put it on your heart. Now, you should feel a heartbeat. If you don't raise your hand, you probably need some help. 
little girl says to her father, says, hey, I know Jesus lives in me. He says, how do you know that? Because I can feel him walking around in there. I know it's silly. But it's been a good silly for me this week. A reminder, God is close to the brokenhearted. You know what I've summarized all this with? This is what I think the whole message of Daniel is. God's got this, and God's got you. And you make it personal. God speaking. I got this, and I got you, babe. All the old people got it. I feel them walking around in there. That's the kingdom of God, the, uh, the not yet and the here and now. So what are we supposed to do, Tom? Just take these things on the chin? I hope not. <laughs> if it is, that's not what I'm very good at. I, I still pray, and I think we should all pray, God, take this away. Shut the lion's den, shut their mouths, make the furnace not hot, fix the trial, heal the marriage, heal the body. Pray those things. Of course, ask God to do that. Who knows? He's done it before. He may do it for you. He may do it for me. But also pray, God, give me the grace to keep going. I got this, and I got you. I got this, and I got you. Because God's Spirit is actually with us. We're not alone in the furnace, and you're not alone in the lion's den. You're not alone in the troubled home, or you're not alone in the troubled job. You're not alone in the moral compromise. You're not alone in the victim. You're not alone in any of that. You don't face life in some isolation or in a state of abandonment. If you ever think you do, put your hand on your heart because you can feel them walking around in there. No, we face life hand in hand with the life giver who said he's close, he, I am near to the brokenhearted. And we face life with God himself. So brother or sister, as we grind our way through this life, and we have weeks that are tough, and you're having a week that is tough, or an issue that makes you afraid, you are not alone. Christ lives in you, and his presence will bring you peace. His presence will bring you comfort, and his presence will bring you strength. I got this, and I got you. I got this, and I got you. Lord, thank you so much for these good people. They've been so kind to the Hardings this week. The love and compassion that they've poured out has been amazing. It's actually been very overwhelming. And Lord, it's been, they have been, the hands and feet of Jesus to us this week. The thoughts of reminding us that uh, you got this and you got us. And we felt your love through them this week. And I pray just now for my friends in the room that are going through their particular lion's den, their particular furnace. I pray right now by the power of the Holy Spirit that's walking around in there, they would sense you got them. You got the issue and you got them. I got this. I got you. And that like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and countless other people that are part of that great cloud of witnesses, we'd all stay faithful. We'd all cling to you and allow you to carry us through. It's in your name we pray. Amen.